from Boss Track, it's Her Hype Squad, a show about amazing women who've made incredible strides as leaders in their industry. They're here to support you and your leadership growth, to encourage you and hype you up as part of your Hype Squad. Hello, and welcome back to a new episode of Her Hype Squad with Boss Track. I'm your host, Michelle Harris. In this week's episode, we're celebrating our half year anniversary. This is episode number 26, and we're bringing you all the hits. We're highlighting our top most listened to episodes this week by providing five to 10 minute audio clips from each episode. This is a slightly bit longer episode, but the great thing is that the short clips are easy to listen to during small breaks. I'm thankful to have had so many knowledgeable, experienced, and insightful guests on our show so far. We're looking forward to continuing that trend and have some excellent upcoming guests you won't want to miss. If you want to hear more from any episode, you can find the full episodes on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Just search for our podcast, Her Hype Squad with Boss Track. So I hope you enjoy these highlights from our 12 most watched episodes so far. Enjoy. From episode one with Samantha Burmeister, standing out using personal branding. You talked a little bit about, okay, how can someone in a corporate environment use personal branding? What are your tips for creating that personal brand? Like if you want to be known for something specific, because I imagine a lot of our people have in mind how they want to be seen as a leader. How do you get started? Yeah, so I mentioned that like simple exercise that's kind of a gut check of where are you and where do other people think that you are asking for words, asking for that feedback, Um, but also to sit down and think about what are my values and write down maybe four to five of your core values and then define them. So, you know, if your value is freedom, well, freedom might look different to you as it does to me, as it does to the person next to me. So really defining what those values are and then deciding how you're going to use those values to help you achieve your goals, whether your goals are your own, your companies, your teams, et cetera. Um, So the baseline in personal branding is understanding what you want your brand to be um, and what your brand currently is and what you want your brand to be might be totally different things. Is there any more guidance you might have in trying to stay authentic? to yourself when developing Mm -hmm. the personal brand? Yeah, I mean, so in in a workplace, if you're trying to elevate your title, say, a lot of people think that they need to start behaving like the person in that title. So say that you're in a VP role and you wanna be the president of the company, you think you need to start acting like Joanne the president But if Joanne, the president, is moving out of that role, it's because something new is needed. And it always pays to remember what your own strengths are and how you can amplify those. And good leadership is always helping elevate those around you. So leveraging the strengths of those around you, too, to make sure that you're lifting as you climb is an excellent sign of leadership. You don't have to go be Joanne, the leader. You can be yourself, the leader. and really leaning into your brand. And it sounds cheesy, like no one else has what you have and your unique value. Um, But I mean, Adidas didn't wait for Nike to go under before Adidas became Adidas. Like, and now we have Allbirds and we have Noble and we have, you know, the Reebok CrossFit shoes. Like they all bring their own unique value proposition to the footwear world. We can all bring our unique value into our own brand and our own companies. From episode two with Meredith Icegrow, talking leadership with Meredith Icegrow. As a new leader, what do you think is the most important thing to focus on or to learn? You know, it's, it's a lot of people go, wow, you know, I got this new job and like, I have to do all these things immediately to show my, my worth. And the thing is you were selected because you already did that. So sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. And we don't always allow that that space to be there for a new leader. Um, So I highly recommend take inventory of all of the things around you. What are the things that are working well? What are the things that you would want to implement change on? And don't take action immediately. 
really take the time to assess because your immediate perception on something could shift over the first 30, 60, 90 days. And you want to make sure that you're really seeing what you want to go after, then making a plan, taking others with you, learning who your stakeholders are, learning how to collaborate, even though you're the decision maker, and then taking people along to enroll them and moving everything in the direction that you feel it needs to go. If we just jump into action, sometimes we really miss some opportunities to either leave things and let them flourish on their own, or we might start changing things, but the foundation that needs to happen prior to those changes hasn't happened yet. And that's where we start to, to kind of spiral. You have an experience obsessed strategy and I love that term and I'd love to hear more about it if you don't mind sharing a little bit. Yeah, we came, uh, so we have um, our core values for our company and that is one of them. And uh, that came about because our whole company started off as an experience company and we've morphed over the years. So we, we look a little different than we did when we started, um, you know, several years ago. And experience obsessed was always the pinnacle. Like we were always going for everything about what we do. What is the experience expected? Well, it's gotta be exceptional. And so many people have a low bar for an experience. So it's like, you're going in and saying, I need to be so obsessed with how this outcome needs to be, not like married how we're going to get there, more looking at the outcome. And that is what I'm going for. And I can build all of these beautiful things around that, personalize them as needed to make sure that the outcome is the best one possible. And so when we talk about experience obsessed, and when I use that for myself, I always think about others around me, or am I contributing to their experience as if it were the most important outcome, because to me it is, mm -hmm. right? Their experience is the better outcome sometimes than even my own, because I need to make sure I am caring for the people around me. And so I really have to put extra into everything I do. I might say, well, this is cool. And then I'm like, eh, I think this is cool. Like, mm -hmm. what would everybody else think about this? And it goes back to that, that again, that fail. How do I care for the people around me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think you kind of alluded to that too, is that you can easily apply that and should apply that same thought to your team, like just being obsessed with their experience and make sure they're learning, they have the right uh, resources they need to get the job done. Um, just And even, even really like checking in and sensing how they're feeling about things because people aren't going to always be upfront. It goes back to that conversation we had. They're not always going to be upfront with you. So you need to kind of sense, sense how they're doing so you can ask the right questions or, you know, try to try to keep things from happening that, you know, could lead to. Yeah. And that is contagious. Mm -hmm. I always think like in the best way possible, when people find out that you really care for your team, and care about your team as the individuals and the teams that they are, that gets around. Yeah. And that creates such an amazing work dynamic that even the ripple effect of other teams, when they start to feel that and, and see that happening, they take that on and, and maybe don't even know it or put words to it. It just becomes like, it permits everything around you. It just becomes a part of how you all operate. And it really can shift your entire work culture without like a program or a, mm -hmm. you know, any like, we are doing this thing, you know, like an initiative or a launch or anything like that. It can just become a part of your values. And I know you're leading remotely. Is there anything that you have learned from leading that you might be able to pass on? Because I think even though we've all been experiencing it, we're still trying to figure it out, especially as it becomes more hybrid. Yeah, I love that. I fortunately was leading remotely before the pandemic and I've been working remote for several years. So I feel like I kind of got a head start on that. Mm -hmm. And I can think back to the early days of how to organize myself. So I always have me time. So as a leader, if I don't carve out me time, I can't have you time. Mm -hmm. And so if I just pack my day with calls and projects and, and all these things, then that's missing the point. It's not showing somebody how full your calendar can be. It's showing 
the robustness of all of the things that you're putting on the calendar. And part of that is admin time or quiet time or heads down time, whatever you want to call it. You carve that out for yourself every single day. Yes. And do not let somebody put it on there, even though they see it, it's mm -hmm. yours. The other thing is some type of work schedule or cadence or routine is super helpful. So when I first started uh, remote, I was like, well, I can start my day at this time or this time or this time. And, you know, after a while, it's like, I look forward to actually days when I can go and see people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, humans. <laughs> yeah. um, and so like when I have in person days, I clear my calendar because I want to spend as much time being present with the people that I am physically with, because sometimes things just don't translate to the remote world. Mm -hmm. The other side of that is check in a lot, not to the point of maybe micromanagement, but have a structured cadence of team check-in, individual check-in, and then maybe office hours where people can come to see you as needed. Find what works for you. Uh, and it sometimes it can shift. It doesn't have to be, well, this is how it is for the rest of my life. Your teams, depending on where you all are in your journeys, may need different things at different times. So learning about that um, and understanding and asking along the way, does this still work for everybody? Mm -hmm. Does this time still work for you for our one-on-ones? Does, you know, do you want to do a walk and talk? Let's go out, like, let's get outside and just talk on the phone. Everything doesn't have to be, you know, on a video, which is super fabulous and like so high tech, you know, and it doesn't have to be, right. it can be a get on the phone and get outside in nature and take the call from, you know, walking, you know, so it's, it's a matter of finding what works and playing around with all of those things. What would you say is the best leadership advice you've ever received? Be honest and kind. Mm -hmm. uh, there were times where I was honest and I wouldn't say unkind. I would say there, I was maybe too direct mm -hmm. without the, without, you know, thinking about the words I was using. Mm -hmm. And there were times where I was nice and not honest. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between nice and kind. So it's, it's really important to be both of those things. Yes. From episode 10 with Candace Hickman, storytelling for impact with Candace Hickman. You are somewhat of a specialist in storytelling. So I'd love mm. for you to share how storytelling can help a leader, especially mm. a new leader as they try to make their way leading a new team. Yeah. Yeah, well, st storytelling is something that um, has been central to my work, particularly when it comes to personal branding, because I've spent a lot of years, you know, the last kind of seven years working with a lot of different leaders in the self-help industry, both rising and established leaders, helping them to understand who they are, what they have to offer, and then how to communicate uh, the value of what they offer in a way that feels really resonant. And we do that through storytelling. And so that's what the connection is there between the storytelling and the work that I've done in personal branding. And so storytelling is just like one of those incredible skills to have because we're all connected through stories. You know, when I tell a story, you might glean some type of lesson from it. The person sitting next to you might glean a totally different lesson, completely based upon um, their own personal experience and their relationship to the story that you're telling. And so storytelling has this really powerful way of kind of breaking down barriers. It requires that the person telling the story is willing to get vulnerable. It, it, it is this opportunity to kind of connect with people on a deeper level that maybe just like giving information or providing education doesn't always have the capacity to do. And so uh, telling stories is something that is both powerful when it comes to branding yourself or marketing your services as it is to actually connecting with people and holding space as a leader. And so, yeah, storytelling is, is a huge part of, of what I've been doing over the years in helping people to yeah, really drop into who they are, understand better who they are uh, in order to communicate the value of what it is that they have to offer. So once somebody understands, okay, I need to start adding story in my communication, but if somebody is maybe a little more analytical, like, like I was my fine, I had a finance background, so my brain wasn't always going to telling a story, like how, 
How did they get started? Mm. Well, I think a big part of this is understanding uh, who you are, understanding um, kind of the background or where you come from, specifically in relationship to the audience that you're in front of, right? Like the story that I tell um, in different scenarios, my personal story, it might come out in different ways. And so there is this kind of balance. Firstly, we want to understand what you believe that you're here to do, right? What do you believe that your purpose is or your call is or what is it that you believe is your function in the workplace? Firstly, we have to understand that. There is like the who am I piece, right, that I think is really important. And then all of the elements around how did I actually get here? Why am I here? What brought me here? What experiences in my background have driven me to this place in this time that I exist in right now? So when we can kind of understand the background, the who are we piece to really be anchored uh, in that aspect, that's kind of the first step in understanding um, where we're at in terms of telling stories. The next thing we have to understand is like why we're telling the story, right? Like if I'm going to get ready to tell a story, what would be the purpose of this story? Is there something that I am trying to sell? Right. Do I have something that I have on offer that I want to sell? Do I have a um, an idea that I'm trying to communicate in the workplace um, that I need people to actually buy into? Is the purpose of me telling this story for connection and entertainment and to break down barriers and create more uh, vulnerability and a sense of a deeper sense of connectivity with people in a social setting or even in a team environment? So it's understanding who am I, the background that brought me to here, the why and what it is that I'm actually trying, like why would it be important for me to tell this story? And then the third component here is like who needs to receive the story, right? Like who, who is on the other end, the receiving end of the story, and what is it that they need? What is, their, what is their story, like broadly as an audience? What brings them to this moment in time where they need to hear your story? You know, are they here to be entertained? Is there some type of pain point when it comes to marketing? Is there some type of pain point, some type of struggle, some type of pleasure that they are seeking that in you in telling your story allows the person to either feel inspired or move to action in some type of way? So we're not in order for a story to really be effective. Uh, we firstly have to understand the background that brings us to this place and time where we're ready to tell the story what it is that we're trying to communicate around or why we feel the need to tell a story to begin with, what's the thing that we're trying to sell, the interaction we're trying to have, and then who is it that we're actually communicating, what's their story. And where those things bridge, where all of those things come together, is the point of like a really effective and resonant story. From episode 12 with Amy Robinson. Talking Remote Leadership with Amy Robinson. You brought up earlier about not really caring about if they're doing something personal because they have a job to get done and as long as they're getting the job done. And I think that's such an interesting shift from as I was coming up in leadership roles myself, I think in the past, a lot of the thought has been around you owe me a certain number of hours of work and not necessarily, you know, you owe me these things that I hired you for. So it was always like, I think it just developed. I mean, probably because we started out of like the industrial times when everybody was at a machine or on the operations floor and they were getting paid by the hour. But like when you think about white collar work or salaried work, I mean, it's just a different mindset that I don't, I don't think people, a lot of people can make that differentiation. And I don't know how to get past that sometimes, because I think there are a lot of people like, even like you said, that do still think like that, like you owe me this number of hours, not like this work. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest challenges that initially, I think so many roles could have been remote so long ago. But the decision makers 
are from a time when remote wasn't an option, so they don't understand. And it was exactly that. The, the lawyer that got promoted was the one that put in the most billable hours. And, you know, the, the manager that was working the hardest was the one that was there from open to close. And I think a lot of it was the idea of, of observational versus data. I've, I've often found in executive teams aren't necessarily as, as interested in data as what they're seeing. Once you get to a certain level, you have to understand that you can't personally be part of everything. And I think that's what makes a successful executive is, is somebody who can balance that. I see everybody working hard and I see that, you know, the numbers are successful. But so much of it was exactly that restaurant manager that if somebody is leaning against a wall, they could be cleaning, they could be helping another table, they could be getting ice, they could be taking out the trash. Like it was always, when I worked in restaurants way back, it was full hands in, full hands out. So it didn't matter what you were carrying, as long as you had something in your hand. And so we always had this joke of, we would carry around a dustpan and everybody just assumed you were looking for a broom. And so we looked like the most productive people because we were about to sweep as soon as we found the broom. When in reality, it was the same thing as having pretend code on the screen and everything else. It's been a struggle and I don't, I don't have the answer to yeah. how to make that leader that is so used to trusting the observational part and how much the observation, it, it's a component. It's not the whole picture. And at the end of the day, the only thing, you know, that really does matter are those bottom line numbers. These are businesses at the end of the day. And so if somebody's working a hundred hours, but they're producing less than somebody working 10 hours, getting past that, but they're working so hard. Yeah. This, yeah. You know, generally that person that's working so hard is in the wrong role. It doesn't make them a bad person. It just makes them in the wrong role. And we far too often just look at that, the effort put in as opposed to the outcome. And it is very tough to balance, but that's a conversation that I have often with my boss of, you know, well, he, we have, we have a couple of our team members that are just nice laid back people. They don't, they're not excitable. And so he takes that as they're not connected, they're not working hard, but they deliver the top results. And so I keep having to bring them back to here are the results. But every time we have a meeting, they're not on the camera. When they are on the camera, they're not looking. Okay, let's have a conversation with them about it makes my meeting experience less successful that you're off camera, but let's not take that to a place where we're evaluating their performance because that does not affect their performance. It, ex it affects your experience. So it's really tough to, to get those leaders to understand the difference between their perception and what the end of the day, the data is telling us. And a lot of it comes down to, do they fully understand what this person is responsible for? Yeah. And that's what I find. I have as many conversations with managing up of this is the expectation of the role can we there's nowhere in this job description that says camera has to be on so it's it's yeah it's definitely it's always been a challenge and I I don't feel like it's changed with the remote I feel like I'm having the exact same conversations I did on premise as I am on screen yeah with how to how to evaluate performance from episode 14 with Stephanie Simon. Stephanie Simon on motivation, finding outlets for stress, boxing, inspiring others, and the daily stoic. What are some things that you were challenged with and how did you, I don't know, necessarily know, even if you didn't overcome them, like how did you handle those? I would say, the, one of the biggest challenges is was being dismissed and being kind of just counted out before even showing up. On like the first week that I showed up to my first unit, I'll remind you guys that I was the first female platoon commander 
ever at this unit in the history of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina slash the entire East Coast. There had never been a female amphibious assault officer in charge ever. So before I showed up, these people had no idea who I was. They just looked at my name. They looked me up on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And someone that was there, a, a guy that, you know, a peer of mine that I talked to within the first week, he kind of broke the bad news. And it was a wake up call for me. He's like, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to like make you mad or like piss you off. I just want you to know that like a lot of people in your platoon, a lot of people, they were upset that you were going to be their platoon commander because you're a woman. And they looked you up and they found your information and they were like, dang it. Like, oh, I don't want to have a female officer. Oh my gosh, it's going to ruin everything. So like that feeling of, wow, I haven't even had five minutes with you guys yet. I haven't even seen you and you're already dismissing me as a leader. It's like, wow, like that, I guarantee none of the guys went through that. I'm, I guarantee that that when, you know, the Marines found out that they were their leaders, that they weren't like, oh, we have a male that's in charge of us, a guy, oh my gosh. You know, like that doesn't happen, you right. know? So I would say that's that was probably one of the hardest things because I had never really experienced that other than maybe, you know, wrestling in middle school or high school when the guy saw me walk in and they're like, what, what is this girl doing here, right? It was different when... I had just spent five years preparing for this moment that I was told it was going to be so glorious and amazing and awesome and put my body and my soul and everything through so much to prepare for this moment to realize that, wow, they already, they already don't want me here. I haven't even done anything yet. I haven't even messed up yet. You know? Mm -hmm. So I would say that was probably one of the hardest things. And then I think the other thing too is one of the other very difficult concepts is that I realized as a female leader, especially in charge of predominantly men, that you don't get to be average. Um, you don't have the luxury of being able to be okay because you being average or okay on a scale to them is subpar. You're subpar, you're below average, you're terrible. Because I, I don't believe that average men and average women are seen equally. I think to be seen as an average person, as an average leader, as a woman, you have to be above average. The scale is completely off. I showed up motivated. I showed up being able to do 20 pull-ups. I showed up being able to out PT, out physically run and, and all my Marines. I knew my stuff. I finished the top of my class in my school for amphibious assault school. I was like number two. I you know, aced all my tests and everything. Did really well. No drama, no baggage. You know, like I, I don't, I didn't have any crazy skeletons or anything I was hiding or any crazy, because there's a lot of crazy scandalous things that happen in the military, to be honest. I didn't have any of that. I came there with a clean slate, with a good record. And it was like that, all of that being said, the accomplishments and being able to do all those things, I was still seen as, eh, you know, yeah. and, and that's a hard pill to swallow. You know, it, it is a hard pill to swallow. And I think to overcome that, you kind of, first of all, you have to accept it, especially if you're in a room with all men, you're in an atmosphere where you're with predominantly men, you have to accept the fact that you have to be above average. And once you take that in, you digest it and you're like, okay, you know, this is how it's going to be. Then I feel like there's no surprise of that. You know, that's not a surprise anymore. Like what? Well, he got the same score as me, but why? Is he getting all the opportunities? Well, because average for you as a female is not the same as average for him as a male. It's not the same. And so I'm not 100% sure how that works in the corporate world, but I'm sure there's probably similarities, right? A little bit in, in terms of male versus female. Yeah. Standard. So other than kind of getting yourself mentally prepared for the way it was going to be? Are there certain things that you did with your team when you came on board to, I don't know, I don't want to say prove yourself because that's not, you know, that's not the point. You shouldn't have to prove yourself, but to right. get them to follow you as a leader. Well, like I said, I showed up in 
the best possible shape I could be in. Mm -hmm. So I pretty much took, I think that one of the biggest things is take away any ammunition, come in in shape, come in knowing your stuff, Mm -hmm. come in with a good attitude, right? Be that positive person and also be relatable. That was one of the things that I think separated me a lot from a lot of other people is that I was relatable. I didn't like to see myself as above or higher than the Marines that I was in charge of. As a matter of fact, when we were on ship and we, you know, we had like a short deployment to Iceland, there were times where I would bring out my guitar and like my little microphone and go down to where, you know, the enlisted people are at and perform for them and sing with them and like literally show them like, Hey, I'm here down here. I'm down here in the trenches with you guys. I'm not just going to sit up in my room with all the other officers and drink tea and coffee and fold my, you know, cross my arms. That's one of the things that I took pride in was the ability to re- be relatable and to show them that, you know, like I see them, I see you guys, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yeah, if you're, if you are prepared and you take away the ammunition or give people zero, I don't know, like zero reasons, it's not a hundred percent possible to give them zero reasons, but if you take away any type of ammunition or reason for them to say, yeah, but what about that? I think that that can mitigate a lot of things. And that for me as an officer, you know, when I first showed up like that, that's one thing I made sure I was in shape. I made sure I was well-read. I made sure that I was asking questions and making sure that, you know, I was learning and inspecting and being around a lot and, and, and making sure that I was, you know, watching and taking notes. I always had a notepad with me. I would write down people's names and write down good things they did, bad things they did. And I tried my best to record things, not record them like this, but record and take notes so that I could reflect back later and, you know, like learn from mistakes. And, and so, and then, you know, we talked about earlier about using your strengths and weaknesses, you know, as a way to capitalize your leadership. Well, for me, I knew, okay, I love to box. I love PT. How about I do a boxing physical training session with them where we spar, we fight each other. Because in their minds, right, obviously they see a female. They see someone that is five foot six and 150, 160 pounds. But if they see someone like that, a female, someone that's in the now doing a male dominated thing like boxing, right? Showing them that, that she's not afraid, showing them that she's willing to get dirty and willing to get in there and throw hands, like it it shows them, it shows them, okay, wow, like she's she's willing to put herself out there and she's actually she's mentally tough physically tough but she has that that toughness about her now we see in her what we didn't necessarily think that she had in the beginning because she was a female so for me boxing was the way that I could show them like you know I am capable you guys I know that I might not look tough because I'm a woman but at the end of the day, if we were to go to combat, if we were to be in a, in a dangerous area and we'd had to, we had to fight people, now you guys see, like, I, I am a fighter and I got your back and I will make sure, I'll show you right here in this setting, like, that I understand what it means to be a fighter, even though I might not look like it. You know what I mean? And so I'm not saying go out there, everybody, and learn how to box and fight people. But what I am saying is for that environment, in the Marine Corps, in the military, where toughness and grit and physicality in general is very much so something that is like elevated and something that is admired. I knew that that would be one of the really important ways that I could show my Marines and kind of gain that respect from them was through boxing, through ground fighting, through wrestling. And so that's kind of what I did very early on in my, in my time. From episode 18 with Jen Rivera. Jen Rivera on lateral leadership, professional development, tantrums, and messy desks. In all of the leadership experience that you've had, like what were some of the biggest challenges you ran into or faced as a leader? I think communication primarily. I think I identified really early on that a lot of the issues and the obstacles that would come up in reaching goals had to do with a lack of communication. A lot of the people issues had to do with a lack of communication or Band-Aid solutions on symptoms of a greater problem, right? So Band-Aid solutions really common in the corporate world. 
I'm sure that your listeners, you know, see it all the time. There's a lack of an effort to identify what the core, what the heart of the problem is, and then address that. And there's a lot of, well, we're just going to address the symptoms of the problem. And I think that's a communication issue as well. So when it comes to the problems that I did see, I think it stemmed from a lack of communication, whether that was enough communication, the right communication or communicating to the right people. Or we're putting Band-Aid solutions on a problem that we haven't necessarily called out or we don't want to call out. And so now we're just causing frustration from addressing the symptoms rather than the, the actual issue. Speaking of communication problems, <laughs> kind of leads me to our topic for today, which is leading across organizations. Can you tell us what your experience has been there and you know what you see as some of the challenges? For lateral leaderships, and you know, I th I don't think that it's talked about enough, and I don't think that people develop their professionals to do it. So, I'll give you an example: project managers. Project managers are lateral leaders all the time, right? Because they're managing product projects that usually touch other parts of the organization, sometimes touch every aspect of the organization, and they have to complete this project to success. But they're dealing with people that they're not necessarily directly managing. And so they have to rely on their own skills for lateral leadership to get that project in on time, to get quality work from people, you know, all the different aspects of what a project manager does. And I don't like using the word, you'll hear me say lateral leadership or lateral leader a lot because you're not a lateral manager, right? You're managing a project, but you're a lateral leader because if you're not leading, then chances are you're not necessarily going to get what you need on time. You're not going to get it to the standard that you're expecting. You're going to miss things from your team members that weren't putting in that extra for you because you're not a leader to them, maybe. And there's a lot of things, a lot of nuanced things that can be missed or miscommunicated or under-delivered because of a lack of leadership. So a good, a good visual for people when they think of lateral leadership is to think of that project manager. And we know that we end up in teams working on all kinds of projects, but a lot of issues that we have fall under, have I identified who those key people are that are on this team that I need to rely on and that I can lead? And then how do I build a relationship with them? So in the same illustration, if a project manager is dealing with a super busy department and every department manager and department head is going to say that their department's busy, right? So if they're dealing with somebody who's stuck on that, where we're just so busy, we're so busy, this is interfering. It's really simple to start developing that, hey, I know that you're really busy and I can totally appreciate that. I have to get this done. I need you to do it. How? What can I do to make this easier on you to get it done for me? You know, what are those what are those little things and develop that rapport with them? Because if you, if they don't feel like you're doing something for them, it's less likely that they're going to go out of their way to do something for you, even if it's required for them of their job, right? So even if they're on that team for that project management task. So I think that identifying who those key people are, the decision makers, the people who can move something quick for you or get it done or have their team get it done is really important. And then making sure that you're having that kind of reciprocal relationship with them, not just a, I need this from you and you have to do it because I'm the project manager and that's the deadline. That's just not a way to interact with people. What are some strategies that you've used to help build relationships or influence people? I mean, in a project or even outside, just working with the organization? Yeah, so Ashcash Exantis was one of the youngest credit union CEOs before he retired as a banker. He was 31 years old when he became a CEO. And later on, he he's written like a dozen books and he talks about financial literacy and publishing. But something that he says consistently is you need to have less asking and more telling. Now, there needs to be some context around that, right? Because that can be taken inappropriately. But it's more like you need to listen to what's happening and then say, okay, well, this is what I see. And let me tell you how I think that we can overcome whatever it is, right? So when you're getting that buy-in, you're listening to what's happening with the other person in front of you, listening to their needs, listening to their wants, listening to what's happening between the line when it comes to communication, right? Between the lines. And then you're saying, okay, this is what I'm hearing. And then you repeat that back to them. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. I think that we can accomplish this by doing X, Y, Z. And there's less kind of asking permission 
well, what if we did this? Or no, hey, I, I'm i telling you, I think I have a really great strategy or, or solution for this. I think that it starts with listening though. And then you tell them, hey, this is how we can overcome this. Going back to listening and hearing what people need and the challenges that other people are faced with and how do we work through you know, prioritizing requires a bit of emotional intelligence. Do you talk about that at all as, as a leader? Yeah. So I think emotional intelligence is important, but I actually go somewhere very specific with it most times, which is what is your internal self-awareness and your external self-awareness? So internal self-awareness is I know myself, right? External self-awareness is I know how my personality and the things that I believe are impacting the people around me. And that's before I get to them or when I'm just meeting them, how I respond to them. So if I meet someone and they are an introvert and very quiet, and I come at them with a bunch of extrovert energy and talking a mile a minute, and like I've had 18 cups of coffee, right? Then immediately they're probably going to physically and mentally withdraw from me, right? And so maybe you come at them kind of even keeled and then you respond according to their energy level, right? So that's beyond emotional intelligence, which is the umbrella of this, right? It's that external self-awareness. What I've realized is a lot of people have some self-awareness, but a lot of people don't realize the external self-awareness that they have to have and how they impact other people in the things that they say and the things that they do, their body language. I I met somebody at a street festival a few months ago and it was a friend, we were meeting her and she had had several drinks. And she was so loud when we greeted her that my husband physically backed away from her. (laughs) And she was, you know, not really all there to notice, but she's, you know, pretty loud anyway. But he physically, he was so physically, my husband's an extreme introvert. He was so physically like affected by the volume and the energy from her that he took steps back, right? So I think that there's a a less alcohol induced version of that, you know, <laughs> yeah. where we need to we need to be paying attention to how we affect other people. And that's part of emotional intelligence. From episode 19 with Lene Remendino. Lene Remendino on being confident and assertive, giving feedback and being authentic. For women in communication, when they're trying to be confident and assertive, and they, there's a bias there where they're taken as being aggressive, maybe you can offer your perspective on that and maybe can get into talking about like, what do you think drives that? And, and then we can go from there. You know, when you and I spoke about doing this, of course, it's right up my alley. And I think that there's women are often perceived as, and I should say, maybe, maybe even by other women, this isn't a gender thing, but I think that we, especially depending on the generation that we're, we're referring to that women should maybe be a little more meager and, you know, more mild tempered or, you know, certainly not too passionate and definitely not too bold. And so I think that, you know, my perspective um, might be jaded for some, might be more biased for some because I am a bold communicator. And I think something a lot of people refer to me as is confidence. So when you combine those two, already you walk into a room and I hear you kind of have a presence. And so then you speak and you speak so concretely. And it's, I I think there, unfortunately, it can automatically have some people shut down on you or, or consider you too much of something of any kind. And I think we get it in every, every single one of us gets it every single day. The, the quiet ones, they hear you're too quiet, right? So I think mm-hmm. I don't want to. I, I don't want to say that we aren't all uniquely ourselves, and we all don't hear feedback, or we all have to live with everyone's perceptions. But as you know, I think you've heard me say I can't live up to everybody else's perceptions, right? And I think the world we've changed and morphed, I think, into wanting everyone to be their most authentic selves. But then when we say that, do we really understand what that means? And mm-hmm. do we really want it? Like, And do we know how to handle it? 
That's, mm-hmm. that's really the interesting part. And so for me, my perspective on, first off, the word aggression, just, it hurts my soul. I think, you know, when you know certain styles of communication and, and you know, whether you know DISC or whatever the case may be best, you can do the best communication disc, which is an affiliate to disc or even Myers-Briggs. When you learn those components about an individual and you learn that there's just, it's your inborn preferences. It's not, it's not like you're choosing to be anything, but you have people that are very opposite of you. And those individuals are always going to use stronger words to define you. But the word aggression to me, if you look it up, it, it, I mean, it refers to almost like you're willing to walk all over somebody to get what you want. And so I often say I'm very assertive, (laughs) but, and I think in this world, we have to be, Mm -hmm. and there's dynamics that we, you know, that cause that for all of us, but yeah, so that's some of my take. So I'm interested to hear how, what is the feedback that you said, like you've been in meetings where people shut down or feel that it's, it's too much. What is the feedback that you get? Like, how do you know when somebody is responding to you in that way that they're taking your confidence and your bold communication style in maybe a wrong way? Yeah. Gosh, Michelle. Okay. I feel like I'm about to go into therapy or your (laughs) listeners are about to be like, okay, let's listen up. So I will say it's twofold, right? For me, if you are asking my personal experience. So I will tell you, I had a boss one time tell me that I had a superpower and I was like, Oh, okay. That's exciting. Like, I love it. And, and I've heard this through most of my career, but the way that she had shared it with me was that I had the ability to be a forward thinker. I'm a visionary and yet I can connect dots to all the way up through to that future and see things that a lot of people can't necessarily see. So I think then it could appear to some that I'm pushing my ideas on them or when I'm really just trying to help us also see the future. And when you have some individuals that are just action-oriented movers, they wanna get stuff done, which we need all, we need everybody, right, for a team. I think those individuals may tend to feel a little more pressure because with my bold personality, in addition to that, so I think there's always these other little components about all of us, right? So it's not so black and white that I can answer that so clearly, like I would love to for you. I think that it, it just, it, it helps because I'm concrete in the things that I'm saying. And yet it works against me because even when I'm brainstorming, I sound concrete. And so like everyone may think I know what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And inwardly, there's probably that person that's like, no, I need help here. Like I'm I really, I'm just kind of, you know, winging it in the moment and coming up with some ideas because I can, I'm quick, you know, I'm quick that way. It doesn't mean that I feel it's the right way. And yet it can be misinterpreted because of how confident and bold I am in my communication style. How do you coach people through to know if they're really being overly assertive? Because there are times when maybe somebody is being, they don't know how to communicate well, and they are coming across as aggressive because they're uncomfortable with being assertive. But so how do they know? So this is what's interesting to me everything is relationship based right and so for me it is i i live by this adage of talk to and not about and so i feel that that is something that people don't do enough of because of either their fear of ha- having difficult conversations their fear of their own communication style whether they think too much or too little and they just however it's going to come across to another human being i believe in if you care about somebody and you want to have a relationship with somebody and in work we don't have choices that you should have direct communication with each other, but then there's my direct style, right? Mm-hmm. So it shows up in that, but it, I, I don't know another way to coach to this because I believe the only way to live up to someone's perception is if you're working with that individual on their perception. Mm-hmm. And so too many people, too many leaders tend to play middleman 
and tend to, then they have their own bias, right? Where they kind of build in, oh, I've seen that too. And so now it becomes a thing and it's more morphed into maybe your boss's perception versus, you know, it's like the telephone game. You heard this. But I'm going to internalize it as this, and then I'm going to share it as that. And, and it's just so unproductive and nobody's got time for it. Really. It, at the end of the day, a lot of businesses that I've been in, and I, I'm, I would guess maybe even you, it's, we're, it's not so serious that, you know, these things have to get in our way at all. And yet people potentially are fearful of just saying, Hey, when you did that in this meeting today, this is how I took it. Is that how you meant it? No, that's not at all how I meant it. There's what I meant. And it just opens up the gamut to a better place of understanding. And it's just such an underutilized trait that I think people in general work outside of work, inside of work. It's just communication is one of the biggest differences we all face every day and 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 often don't spend a lot of time to hone those skills. From episode 20 with Kristen Gutierrez. Kristen Gutierrez on motivating your team, responding to burnout, empathy, and argan oil. What would you say has been maybe some of the biggest, what are some of the biggest challenges you face so far as a leader? For sure, leading through ambiguity. <laughs> that's a that's a big one. Um, being able to like look for signals, establish timelines, create the milestones that you want, like measuring the KPIs, understanding how to interpret imperfect data. That's another big one. And then really too, like we are dealing with humans. So just taking the time to reflect and be compassionate um, and leading with that first. How would you say you motivate your teams like at a very high level? That's a great question. And I don't have all the answers, but what I do is I ask them what motivates them and I check in with them on that particular topic, maybe six, every six months, because some people truly are, especially in a sales world, motivated by money and other people truly are not motivated by money as just one example. Right. And so instead of implying that you, the leader knows what's going to motivate them based on conversations you've had or things you've read about them, their bio, the interview you've had, I do truly find this is actually an exercise we recently did where I said like in a few, in your own words, right. And they came back with paragraphs. They came back with bullets. But I said, like, what motivates you? And by asking them what motivates them, I'm then able to tap into that in order to try to drive forward results for the business. And that's my number one tip. And it's a pretty good one. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's excellent. And just kind of thinking through the logistics of that. So when you say you ask them every six months, it sounds like, do you reach out by email? Do you like... Mm -hmm. Do you have set meetings that you have with them every six months and you initiate that conversation? Like, what is the process that you go through? That's a great question, because obviously I'm meeting with my team one to one weekly. We're meeting as a team weekly. Right. Um, In this case, I often use email as a launching point. I'll mention it in one of our team meetings. Hey, I'll I'll be sending this information around to gather and, you know, to gather your feedback. And then I do send it on email because because people are often their guard is let down if they're responding to an email versus being asked on the fly without warning with or without warning. Um, and so I do find that it's so fascinating the answers you get back because it really, you think you know somebody and what motivates them is their cat. <laughs> and that's fine, right? Um, but you get you get answers from all throughout the spectrum from Um, religious answers, again, to financial answers, to family answers, um, to on the job answers, to specifics about like maybe where they're trying to go or holes they're trying to dig out of. I I do find it's innate for people to respond in terms of like what they think the other person wants to hear. That's why I do follow the convert, the email request up with a phone call to talk through their motivate, motivation triggers um, so that we're clear because it isn't what I want to hear or what I think is best for them. It's it's really like what motivates you so that I can help you do your job better. Do you have any kind of thoughts around how to motivate somebody that is feeling burnout? 
glad you asked the question on burnout because I burnout is real, right? Zoom fatigue is real. Um, and the first thing I think it's important to do with anything, especially burnout, is to find the, what the root cause is. So they might be burnt out because they're attending very early calls in the workday where typically their day shouldn't isn't you know required to be starting before 8 a.m., but now they're sitting on 7 a.m. calls. And it's not an exception. It beca it's becoming the rule. So if that's the thing or whatever it is, really find out what the root cause is and then come back and ask them, like, where is right now for you the work-life balance? Or are you, is your burnout related to working toward a promotion that hasn't come yet? You know, in the first example of 7 a.m. calls, I know when my kids, which are still only four and two, mm -hmm. right, when they were even smaller, I had a firm block on my calendar that said, please do not book smiley face. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that was until, it's, you know, six, seven, eight a.m. So I really, because of the season of life I was in, I could not physically take calls before 8 a.m. My client knew it. My boss knew it. My colleagues knew it. And the exceptions to that rule, because my why was really important and the balance was very like a very hard line in the sand. I probably made one exception to that rule in a two year period. Like I was just very like, I will catch the meeting later. I will watch the replay. I will listen to the recording, especially if it was internal. It was a non-starter for me, but, but that's because that was very important to me. But now I'm able to coach and help others to understand, like, even if that isn't your season in life, you're still allowed to not take 7 a.m. calls five days a week, every week, because that too will create burnout. And even though there's the opposite end of that was like, well, let's just stop your day early, right? It's still not enough for some people because, and that's acceptable, right? Because it's just hard to be motivated to work at 7 a.m. or start to feel like it's an exception or expectation, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, when I say like, if they're working toward a promotion that hasn't come yet, Really, the ultimate question is, how, you know, are you the leader and that individual contributor? Are you mutually working toward it? Or is that just a frustration now that has surfaced from the person? And if so, you know, the first step is to outline what that promotion might look like and the goals required to achieve the promotion in order to align the objectives. And we always look at SMART goals being specific, measurable, right, actionable, realistic with timeframes around them. Um, and so it's it's a little bit about what are the goals needed to achieve that promotion and then what are the timelines associated for it? Is that is that realistic? But it's also asking yourself as the leader is what can the organization do to help in either case, right? So like whether you're dealing with 7 a.m. calls recurring and you don't feel like you can suck yourself out of it because you don't have the two-year-old and, and infant at home, well, my reason isn't good enough. There's always a good enough reason to not have 7 a.m. calls. And what can the organization do to support them? And the same is true on the other example where it's like they're work, they want to work toward a promotion. What can the organization do to help? And I think that mm -hmm you as the leader going back to management and making sure that HR, you know, is there HR resources that they need? Is there executive level support that they need? Could they benefit from a mentor outside of your team? Could you help connect them to different people? Sometimes I find a lot of times, you know, people just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's just coming back to like, yeah. Um, helping to avoid the burnout. I, I don't think like at the end of the day, like I said, burnout is real. And once you get to the root cause of it, then are you doing everything you can to help support and drive that forward? From episode 21 with Renee Lopez Cantero. Renee Lopez Cantero on mindset, motivation, moving to joy, pushing your limits and meditation. So we're here to talk about mindset and motivation and I'd love for you to tell everyone why are you passionate about about that topic? Okay. Well, first of all, my background has been in in marketing and and business development, kind of direct response for the last 20, 25 years. And in that process, I used to be the person kind of behind the computer. So I have my MBA and I always was more on the strategic side. Even before I was in marketing, I worked as a senior financial analyst at some of these 
larger real estate brokerages, doing the deal books and really thinking things through. But in that time, as you grow and you realize, wow, I'm not only left brain, I'm also right brain and good at integrating things. I said, you know what? I want to do more um, customer facing. And that's why about six years ago, I moved over to EKN Solutions to focus on their, their digital division in the United States. And um, in that process, even though they hired me, they actually found me on LinkedIn. So that's another plug. Use LinkedIn. It's great for networking and, and keeping up with what's going on in your industry. Um, they had confidence in me that I would do well just based on my track record of success and my large network. However, because I was not as forward facing in terms of direct sales with, you know, CMOs and things. I, as a person, it wasn't imposter syndrome, but it was a little bit of, I don't want to be salesy. I'm very mm -hmm. consultative. And so there was a little shift there that happened where I started saying, I'm helping these people. And not just kind of that voice in your head that you fake it till you make it. It was more, I really sincerely, that's what I wanted. I was at that level in my career, but I didn't want to just close a sale, especially if it wasn't going to make sense for the client. I really wanted to have impact in their business to kind of help them in their lives and, you know, grow their business. It's always exciting to, to see growth. And if I could do that at one company, I can do that directly for these companies. So that's kind of where the whole mindset in business came in because when just reframing the paradigm can really make a difference. Um, otherwise background besides just this new position where it required a paradigm shift in the role was maybe I've been doing coaching for about 20 years. I have a personal um, business coach um, that it's not, I mean, obviously it's always good to get your feelings out, but it's really not like therapy. It's very proactive in, in, and there's nothing wrong with specific therapy anyway. It's just um, more proactive in terms of I'm stuck here. I'd like to be here. How do we get there? Or, you know, I don't know if people have seen that that pie puzzle. I don't know if there's like a technical name for it, but you have different slivers in your life. And I can share some links on some of those diagrams. Yeah. It was really mind blowing to see there's different slices of the pie of your life, whether it be just business, professional, personal. Now moving on to the other side, um, spiritual family relationships and your personal environment. So there's all these components. You might be a nine in business, you know, like just doing great with your income and revenue, but if something's lacking on the, the personal side or you're not taking care of yourself emotionally or maybe even getting enough rest or your your diet, like it's off balance. And, and you might think, oh, nobody knows because I'm just doing awesome and crushing it at work. So, you know, that's hard to sustain over the long term. So that really spoke to me because even if I was at some sevens, which is average, I thought, I don't, I don't want to be average. I mean, who really says like, I feel great about being average. You know, we're always like, at least if you're a, a professional woman who are the boss, the boss people that are on this call, right? Yeah. So I think that was where that mind shift kick kind of started to kick in when I started this coaching process and realized, okay, I'm, I'm okay. I'm good, but I want to, I want to take it to the next level. That's like one tool that we yeah. can use in terms of just, sometimes we don't always even check in with ourselves. I mean, mm -hmm. these are kind of the soft skills that like, obviously work is one thing you want to do well in your career. If you're an entrepreneur or you know, all the types of corporate um, opportunities that there are out there. But if, if you're not working on growing yourself, you're limiting, you're limiting your, your ceiling. Are you personally, when we initially talked, I know you mentioned some personal things that maybe helped you shape your, your own mindset. Are yeah, there some yeah, things you definitely. could share? Sure. I'd love to. Okay. So trying to think when I got involved in all this, but I definitely had the the more recent things that I can recall is I have a really good friend who um for some reason follows like this this cool influencer on Instagram who his name is Jesse Itzler and um 
wife is Sarah Blakely, and and obviously people know her, especially professional women, because self-made billionaire of Spanx and, and all of this. So he 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 he's an entrepreneur in his own right, but he really is into this mindset thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess as a serial entrepreneur and just the way he thinks, he he's um what do you call it? Like a not even just a long distance runner. It's the kind of runners that they don't just do a marathon; they do like these yeah. like extreme sports so anyway I don't know my friend was like I think you're the only person who would want to do this with me so they're having this camp for for his coaching program and would you like to do it with me because actually I had done a marathon before and a few half marathons so I already was like into this whole holistic thing of like pushing your limits and doing things that you'd like to do I just didn't formalize it or talk about it much you know um so I said okay I'll do the camp and it was so cool because Part of the camp was you you have a day where you do some things you've never done before, like these four hour endurance runs in the mountains, like mm-hmm. not only running in the mountains, but also doing like all these squats and deadlifts and sandbags. And like, it sounds overwhelming, but I was like, okay, I'll get, I'll do it. Let's see how good I am at it. And you were supposed to train in advance and do all of that. So I said, okay, I'll check it out. So I trained, I went, and I was so pleasantly surprised because not only did I do that experience and do better than I expected, they had a whole coaching element of it it the night before. So they brought in uh, this expert who was actually from the Marines who kind of just explained how badly you have to want it and like focusing and like, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, yes, you could fall and hurt yourself or, you know, be exhausted or whatever, but he's like, you're not going to die in the chair. So just that expression is just like, go for it. Like, don't leave anything on the table. And how often do we really just like go for it at that level? Like when we have a goal, that really shifted something with me, you know? And then I guess being in that environment where everybody was like trying to elevate their standards, you're not just in the comfort zone. And sometimes you need that to kind of realize, yes, I can take it to this level. So that was cool. They had a speaker from Great Britain um, that I follow that she was, she did this cool exercise where like you put your arm out and then you go like this. And then she's like, okay, now tell your arm, you're wonderful. You can go further. And then like you go double the amount and it's, it's a silly exercise, but it just shows you like the first try, you can always do better if you if you put your mind to it. So it was that whole shift. And then you do like an ice bath for, for like four minutes. And oh things, things that are just like, they seem crazy, but they're cool. Because when you finish, you feel like you could conquer anything. And actually that group, I did a coaching thing with them as well last year where you put on the calendar all these cool things you want to do and accomplish. And then through that, I'm doing a new one this summer. Um, in June called 29029, which is the elevation of Mount Everest. Now, wow. I've never hiked a mountain. I'm not hiking Mount Everest or Mount Kilimanjaro, <laughs> but it's like in the summer, you go up a mountain like eight times in a certain time period. It's like, I'm going to be at a certain decade and I want to accomplish these things because why not? You know, so just always uh, pushing it. I guess it's an adrenaline shot too. So it's kind of <laughs> cool. <laughs> And sometimes we we have standards for ourselves that that nobody would have for ourselves, right? Yeah. And sometimes, even in that mindset, we see things and we're so critical of ourselves. We're 360 around you. Everybody's happy with it. So why mm-hmm. are you, you? We have those voices in our head. I don't know how many thoughts run through our mind each day. Let's try to make most of them positive so we're building ourselves up instead of tearing ourselves down. You know, that as women or anybody, I think that that's the best way to be a boss, right? From episode 22 with Lisa Swigard, Boss Break with Lisa Swigard, Leading with Laughter, Play Personalities, Octopus Jars, and Building Habits. We said we're going to talk about the one leadership related thing, one fun thing, and one inspiring thing, right? Yep. You got it. I know you're very familiar with TED Talks and um, I absolutely love them. For, so first, let's, I'm going to start there, like starting to listen to TED Talks. I am amazed by the level of, of the ability for people to speak on that platform. Like, do you mm-hmm. just learn how to do that? Is that something that you're 
that you just know? Does it come with practice? Does it come natural? Like these people, when they talk are just so well-spoken, like yeah. how does that happen? It's just so inspiring and just amazing because I don't feel that I, when I'm in a room of full of people, I am like a nervous wreck, nervous mm -hmm. wreck. And one of the things that, uh, you know, changing into a remote environment, it, it does lead the ability to be able to speak a little bit better because you don't feel like you're on display for like a room full of people to, that are staring at you. You're in your own home or you're in an office setting behind a camera. So it doesn't make you feel as vulnerable that you're being exposed to everybody. But the TED talk that I watched was uh, Paul Osenkup. He uh, did, it was a, about a 10, 15 minute presentation on leading with laughter. Wow. I absolutely loved his discussion. I think, um, and I, I guess I'll stop talking here in just a second and let you like just jump in. But one of the things that I absolutely love is I love to laugh. I love to have fun. I love, I love humor because it, it immediately puts people at ease, right? So especially in leadership, there's, there's always that you need to connect with your teammates. You need to connect with your team. And what better way than not only be personable, but to be able to laugh with your team, to lead with humor. You know, there's there's always a place and a time for humor. You don't want to be in the middle of a performance management conversation and be like, you're not meeting expectations, knock, knock. You don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to do all that. But I think the general connection that you make with people is is really based on your sense to be your or your that feeling of being relatable. And leading with humor makes you relatable. One of the things that, that Paul had mentioned in there uh, about, he says, you don't take yourself too seriously. You want to be relatable, personable, um, sometimes seem imperfect when you might be sharing, uh, sharing a story. And it just makes you that much more approachable. And with that comes that trust and connection with your team. Yes. So I, I felt very, very inspired by his presentation that he did. And I just think, I think having that sense of humor in the workplace is so very important. And again, I think more so now, I don't know that it would have been as acceptable, you know, years and years, because it's very rigid, very structured, very, I'm your boss. Um, but now there's a definite need for that connectedness. I related so much to what he talked about um, as far as how, of the importance of it. He said, one of the things that he, he said was that laughter is good for us, right? He said like laughing a one minute of laughter equals 10 minutes of rowing. <laughs> so if you think about that, <laughs> if you've ever been on a rowing machine, you know that that one minute can be treacherous. Like it's just horrendous sometimes. And you think about it one, two, three, four, five minutes. And if you laugh and you genuinely laugh for just a minute, like how just good that is for you. And not only just for your physical, but your emotional and your mental well-being as well. And one of the things that he made a comment about, which was just kind of sad, is that people in their 40s laugh on average four times a day. Four times a day, people in their 40s laugh. And that just struck me as no way, no way. So after I, I listened and when I really listened to that conversation uh, or that TED talk uh, with Paul, I really kind of took in, I, I took, I took my mental note then of my days and how many times I actually do laugh a day. And, and it's not as often as what you would think it was. And I'm a pretty like laid back, easy going. I love to laugh. I love to have a great time. And it's still just not as many as what you would think. So one of the, my big takeaways from that conversation is to laugh more and you can almost always laugh yourself into a real laugh. You know, if yeah. you sit and you just start laughing, you're like, this is ridiculous. And you just laugh at yourself for being so <laughs> ridiculous and funny. And it just leads you into a real genuine laugh. So I, I really, again, it seemed something so simple and just so minor of, of a concept, but it, it really resonated and it became very, very huge for me. One of the things he said, people, uh, traits of, of, of best leaders was a sense of humor and that conf having confidence, having that sense of humor and how much that humor reduces social distances, how much it makes people more approachable. And 
seemingly feel more supportive, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think that's so, so critical in, in any leadership role and with any team environment as well. So maybe not even just leadership to, to down to, to the teammate, but peer to peer as well. I think it's just so important. (laughs) From episode 23 with Heather Brizzy. Heather Brizzy on conscious careers, knowing your strengths, good versus bad, hard, and staying curious. I'd love to for you to tell the audience, like, what does being conscious in your career mean to you? I think the biggest part is the intentionality behind a conscious career. It's where we're making choices and decisions and having that point of reflection. And even just looking back at leading teams that are working in an agile method that we retrospect, we look back at what went well and what didn't. So when we have that same type of attitude toward our careers, how can we get to a different place? Because sometimes we can find ourselves in that zone of I'm I'm on autopilot, you know, I'm doing what I've always done. I'm just, I'm moving forward or I'm um, looking for that next level of career advancement, whether it's manager to senior manager, senior manager to, to director, but I may be staying in my zone. So I talked about, I'm in service management now. I started my career on that help desk side, which is under where service management is, but I've also worked on the project management, the program management, but the thread that pulls through all of them is operations. So I see how things work, how people and processes come together that are enabled through technology. So how do you know we help ourselves see and find that clarity around what's the work that I do? What are the strengths that I bring to the table? Where are areas that I want to develop and grow? And how do I get there? And who are the people that we can surround ourselves with to help us or enable us to get there? Or you know, the training that I need or the classes that I wanna take, the books that I wanna read. Like I'm a big reader and that's been huge in my own development and becoming conscious about the choices that I'm making, the things that I want to do, the how I want to lead in my workplace, wherever that is at the time. Yeah. Uh, do you have a process that you use to mentor your teams through that thought process of being intentional? Yeah. I think the first thing is around clarity. So what get clear about the role that you want, the the future that you imagine for yourself. And that's down to like, how much money do I want to be able to make? What are the hours that I want to be able to work? Do I want to be remote, hybrid, in office? What are those things that are really core to how I work best? And how do I bring you know my best self into a workplace? And about that workplace, what is the type of environment that I want to be in? Do I want to be in a high growth private investment led organization where I'm driving and building. So for me, I'm a builder, like wherever that change is happening, I want to be in the middle of that. I want to be leading that. I want to help others through that and to see the the psychological side of the change and not just the doing and the, the how we get there side, because I think that that's really important. So knowing that about yourself and getting clear around that is the first thing. The second thing is acknowledge the things that we value at this stage that we're in. So the things that I wanted at my 25-year-old self, what I'm about to become a manager and lead a team and get ready to have my second child, like all of those kinds of things, I may want a very different workplace or work environment or schedule than I do at this stage of my life where my kids are all adult aged and I want to travel and I, I liked that global experience, but would I know all of those things had I not had the experiences that I've had. So like, even when you are making decisions unconsciously or there's available to you and you're taking those opportunities as they come, you can still look back and reflect on that and see what that shows you about yourself, what you value, what's the important thing for you at this time in your life. And then after I figure out that part, you know, think about my partnership. So whether I'm married, I'm in a relationship, or it's the people that I'm surrounding myself with, all of those things matter because they feed into my ability to grow and to overcome and to see these other perspectives and achieve the things that I want out of my career. The fourth thing is I'd say play to your strengths. I shifted early in my career to a leader who 
understood command and control. Like I came out of the military, like this is how we do things. But I read Marcus Buckingham's First Break All the Rules and then Now Discover Your Strengths. And when I read Now Discover Your Strengths, I was like, there's another way to do this. And the first thing is to recognize my own strengths and how I leverage them in the workplace. But then how do I help others to sew into the areas where they're really strong and make them really good and effective at the work that they're doing and pull away the stuff that they struggle with more? So I think so often we focused on, oh, you're not good at this. So I'm going to help you be better at that. But this is a losing battle in a lot of cases. And we spend so much time trying to up that level rather than up the strength level and diminish the value over on the part that is not really a good fit for us. And then the last one is write it all down. So get it on paper. Like I'm a big fan of individual development plans, of journaling, when we write that down, we're more likely to achieve that. We also have that accountability level. Like I said that I was going to do this. I, I, I've got a plan ahead. I've got timelines that I'm, you know, setting up for myself to achieve these things. But then what do I do to then go back and do that retrospective? I, if I have it written down, I can go back and say, here's what I said I was going to achieve. Here's how far I've come. So let's reflect on that and like celebrate the wins that we have in those moments. and then remember that sometimes we're going to take giant leaps ahead and sometimes we're going to take the little teeny baby steps, but the accumulation of all those baby steps make those giant leaps for us. And finally, from episode 24 with Sonia Kankar Todorovich. Sonia Kankar Todorovich on demanding your worth, imposter syndrome, being bold, and the happiness revolution. What does it mean to know your worth as a leader? So back to the uh, back to the the comments that I made about about that one leader. I'm just going to use her as an example. Mm-hmm. I think that's a that's an example of where you don't want to be. I don't think that you should ever measure your um, your success by the number of dead bodies you left behind. Mm-hmm. And you know some choose to do that, and it's just not a good legacy to leave behind. I think for me personally, a good leader is measured by the number of people that you have inspired and developed to move up in their careers. And I think the uh, epitome of a good leader is the one that can work themselves out of their role, which means they have developed their team so good that that team will replace them or the member of the team will replace them. And, you know, I, I know it might sound like, you know, what are you talking about to work themselves out of a role, but that's the whole point of leadership. They, you know, you have passed on, you can pass on the knowledge and the experience to somebody else that will take over because presumably you will go somewhere higher if you have a good leader yourself. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the way that I look at it. How do you know your worth? You don't measure it by the number of dead bodies. You measure it by the number of people that you have helped elevate in their life and their career. And, and again, that's the main you know, main reason why there's a huge difference between a manager and a leader, because the manager is not measured like that. For management, it's all about the deliverables, the hardcore numbers at the end of the day that you need to deliver on, regardless of what the attrition looks like, regardless what the employee engagement looks like, regardless what any of those soft costs that all of the organization experience look like. But, it, you know, when, when somebody steps back and kind of looks at those soft costs, overhead costs, employee engagement costs, and nutrition costs, and you measure with the, you know, the outcomes that you actually delivered, they tend to balance out. Mm -hmm. So you're really not gaining anything by being a, you know, a manager that's driving compliance. You gain a lot more by being, being a strong leader that's actually getting people to follow based on the fact that they want to do it, not because they have to. And what are some things that, so people listening they're, you know, bu- buying into that, you know, I definitely want to be that one that inspired and motivated and, and leveled people up and helped them grow. What are the key things they should be doing or thinking about to, to do that? I think you have to, well, okay, oh, all right, let me step back before I, I was going to say you have to be authentic, but before you even go down that path, you have to know your own worth, like have the self-confidence that you are everything that you think you are like you know in, in, in a good in a good sense and i think for women most of us have been conditioned to uh to not have the self-confidence that most men have 
and I don't know, like maybe it's a, it's a taboo topic, but you know, like I see a lot of men enter the boardroom, like they own the place and ultimately change the outcome of the conversation, just based on the way they enter the based on the way they present themselves, based on the way they speak, based on the way they sit or stand while everyone else is sitting where you have women that would naturally assume that submissive role and will like sit down in the corners of the boardroom so they don't take up too much space and they're not being seen as being in the way. And it's not because of anything else. It's just, I think, natural the way that we've been conditioned by the way we were brought up, maybe by the uh, by the societal constraints, maybe religious beliefs or whatever the case might be, that has made us to be a little bit more um, less um, less out there than than most men. So I think it starts with that whole self-confidence. And luckily, you know, for all of us, it is just what it is. It's a belief that you can change and you can easily change it if you if you choose to. And there's many, many ways that um, that there's many different talks that you can actually there on YouTube. I think, um, was it Amy Cuddy? Amy Cuddy is my favorite pet talk speaker. And she has this amazing thing that you can look up on on, um, on YouTube that where she talks about the power of body language. And what it actually does and how it actually tricks your mind that even if you don't feel confident, she says, fake it till you become it. And you can and you can do it. It doesn't cost you anything because we all have the, the you know, our faculties to make it happen. We just need to need to know that we need to do it and how to go about doing it until you eventually get out of that comfort zone that, that was kind of ingrained in us. So it starts with self-confidence and, you know, it has a domino effect because, you know, lack of self-confidence will lead to the imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. and the um and the imposter syndrome is it's one of those it's a psychological phenomena that affects everybody but women are a lot more prone to it but not just women it's the women who are overachievers they're more prone to it as well which i also think is kind of cute because it means that imposter syndrome is validating overachievers as being overachievers so maybe that's a silver lining there but you know it's the false belief that somehow you faked your way into a role or a situation and you're now living in this fear that at any given time someone was gonna you know come and out out you and and, you know make you make everyone aware that you are you're an imposter and it's such a bad state of mind to live in especially for a very long period of time because then you start doubting everything that you do you're triple checking everything that you say for the fear of making a mistake and it's just really uh it's not a productive way of, of, of living life so you know I think it's very important for everyone to recognize that imposter syndrome is nothing more than a real feeling because it is real. You're feeling it, but it's a fake reality. It has nothing to do with what's really happening out there. So fake feeling, a real feeling, but a fake reality and everyone goes through it. So knowing that alone should alleviate some of that guilt that you might be feeling about, about experiencing imposter syndrome yourself. Hi everyone. This is Michelle again. Just one more thing before you take off. If you've enjoyed this podcast, consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash boss track or sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's easy to sign up and easy to cancel. Every Monday, we send out a short exclusive newsletter of what we found during the week that we're excited about, we're inspired by, and we're watching and reading. If you'd like to check it out, just to go to thebosstrack.com forward slash newsletter. Just type that into your browser, thebosstrack.com forward slash newsletter. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.